Welcome to the Half Geek, Half Human podcast, where we explore the intersections of technology, business, and life. This podcast is powered by Atiba, a custom software and IT services company in Nashville, Tennessee. Now to your hosts, Anna Kate Ross and Joey Baggett. All right, welcome to the show, everybody. Today we are speaking with Steve Rucker, a musician, a college music professor, and a programmer, also the former drummer for the Bee Gees. So he's going to help us discuss on how technology is reshaping the world of music from digital tools to live performances and the creative fusion of code and composition. We get to hear Steve's unique perspective on the industry today. We're so excited to have you. Welcome to the show, Steve. Hey, everybody. Glad to be here. Looking forward to this. Yeah, thanks for joining us, Steve. We're excited to dig in today. Um, so we wanted to start just with a little bit about your background. Uh, you've lived a, a storied life of with all manner of different musical experiences. You have two degrees from the University of Miami in music, where you're also now a professor. Did you always know you were going to be a musician? I think I always knew I was going to be a musician, but I, I didn't know that I was going to be going to music school from the beginning. So uh, somebody, some knucklehead told me, well, if you major in music, it'll ruin it for you. So I actually, I was an electrical engineering major for a moment, was a sociology major for, for another moment. And it's like, nah, I, I'm doing music. So I went up to Boston and studied at uh, Berkeley College of Music up there for a minute. <laughs> and then I moved down to South Florida where, you know, where I, I stayed at the University of Miami, but I think I always knew I wanted to be a musician, but, you know, uh, it wasn't, you know, the, the, the path that was the most obvious, I think, to, to me or my parents, you know. Did you grow up in a musical family? I didn't really. As a matter of fact, um, when I announced one day that, uh, you know, the, the way it went down, my, my dad one day said, well, you don't want to be a musician, do you? And I'm like, well, yeah. And that was, it, it was the beginning of, uh, it, it all worked out. Okay. Uh, we, we came to terms with it, but it, it you know, it's kind of uh, started a period of, well, you know, you're on your own then, you know, we're, we're not going to support this endeavor. That's why I really admire parents that support their their kids you know in music school because it's tough did you ever like after you kind of hit it big that's what i'm gonna call it i'm gonna call it hitting it big because i think everybody recognizes the Bee Gees. did you just ever like look back at your parents and be like man i told you so like i knew i could do this <laughs> there was that moment uh, when i was on the uh, the letterman show actually and you know i got a call well you know i think this is working out this is after i've been a teaching at the university of miami which was like a great music school for years and years. It's like, okay, all right, I think we're good. And then they came to a huge Bee Gees concert, the Y2K concert. It's like, wow, okay, all right, this is what it's all about. But it definitely wasn't a musical family. You know? Yeah. And then I guess academia has sort of agreed with you also in terms of getting the double degrees and then going to teaching pretty immediately, but having a lot of success in a lot of different kinds of teaching. Uh, did that surprise you or would that kind of suit you? It, it, it sort of did. I mean, I was I was working in South Florida a lot and playing every night. And I'd have people come up and, and, you know, what was that you were doing in the second tune? I think it was like the second verse. And I'd have to think about it. And I got into teaching that way, sort of sideways. And I never really thought that I'd be a teacher. But uh, there was a vacancy at the University of Miami. And I jumped in and I've been there ever since. And I really love it. I mean, it really makes you think about what you, what it is you're doing, you know, and organize your thoughts about that. You know, there's, there's a saying that the the uh, the teaching is the teacher and the student, and that's so true. You know, I, it's it's definitely a give and take. You know, I learn a lot from my students. And how long you've been teaching down at Miami? Oh boy, well, since 1979. So. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So a couple of years. Got gotcha. you. Couple of years. Couple of years. Yeah. <laughs> Do you have a um, so what? So you've you've taught music. You perform music. You produce music. You've written about music. You're a published author. Um, has there been like a favorite era or moment or decade in your musical career that comes to mind? You know, they're all kind of cool. You know, they're all in different ways. I mean, there was the 
sort of exploratory period where I'm, you know, I'm learning about music and I'm in my parents' basement, you know, playing piano and trying to figure things out and teaching myself how to read. And I didn't really have any teachers, which is kind of ironic. Um, And then there was a period of time where I'm just working all the time, you know, Uh, and that led to, you know, the, uh, you know, traveling and playing with the Bee Gees and other, you know, other artists. And now it's, I mean, it's a pretty exciting phase right now, isn't it? You know, with the way, I mean, we're going to be talking about technology, but that's really, really changed a lot of things. I think a lot of people are, you know, run screaming in horror, but I, I've always been a little bit of a wirehead, a little bit of a techie. So I think it's, it's really cool. So, so right now is a pretty good era, you know? Yeah, that's a great answer. Um, and how, when did you become a coder? Okay. So that's a, that's an interesting story in South Florida. Everything used to dry up during the summer, right? Summer came along. Uh, there was like no music work, not so true anymore. And I, I, I reached out to a buddy of mine who had just opened a a shop that sold computers, but also did some programming. And I'm like, Mike, you know, I need to do something during the summer to make ends meet. So he said, well, there's this new language called cold fusion, which is not really happening so much anymore, but it was kind of a full stack language. So I had to learn some database programming as, as well as front end. And I thought, okay, here we go. I'm, I'm going to do this during the summer, make a little extra money and then bag it when the season starts and school starts up and all that. And I liked it. And that was the strange part. It's like, wow, this is pretty cool. I, I remember in back in middle school, you know, I, I, it was one of those sort of model school, you know, new teaching techniques. Well, well, Steve, what do you want to do uh, this semester? Well, I think I want to do computers. And it was like punch cards and all this. So, so, you know, I, I sort of had a, 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 an interest in computers, but I really liked it and I kept doing it. And it's been, you know, challenging sometimes really doing teaching, playing, uh, performing, coding, writing, all of that stuff at one time. But I, I, you know, I I think I kind of like being busy. So, uh, so that's that's how I got into that. It was totally by accident, but something that, that I enjoy doing and still enjoy. That's awesome. And yeah, you seem like a busy guy. Yeah, you have one or two things going on in life. Um, but I, I'm glad we get to kind of move into the technology world now because you've seen it. And I want to specifically talk about you know musical instruments and how that has evolved over time because I think we can all admit uh, music sounds a little bit different today than it did back in the 80s. Yes, it does. Um, yeah, so I, I've also on the side, Joey here, I'm, I'm a DJ. And so first of all, thank you for for all the hits that helped make the dance floors quite a bit easier for me. <laughs> but <laughs> You're welcome. It, it's true though. <laughs> I mean, staying alive is a, it's a crowd favorite, always will be. But... It, so just looking at how it's transformed, what is it like now with just speaking just on the instruments? What is it like now versus what it was when you first started playing? And if you want to stick to drums, you can, or if you want to talk about other stuff, but I'm just curious about like what the difference is in your time in music. How, mu- how much time do we have for this? Well, it's been a crazy ride. So obviously it started when I, when I first started, it was all analog stuff. Um, you know, like I said, the piano, upright piano in my parents' basement. If you wanted to record, you know, then you would practice, go into a studio, pay an engineer a bunch of money, pay the studio a bunch of money, hope that something happens with it. Maybe pay a lawyer a ton of money to fly up to New York and and spend all your money and, you know, whining and dining and then nothing to show for it. I mean, it was just such a crapshoot, you know, back then, but it was all obviously analog stuff. Well, the first, I think the first thing that came along for me uh, that really changed things was I bought, you know, one of those old Lindrums. It wasn't old then. It was, 
It was brand new. And then nobody in town had one. I think there were two people in, in the whole town that had one. And I think Morris Gibb with the Bee Gees was, was the only other person. And I would walk into a recording session with this piece of gear. And it's like, what in the world is that? And I, I would program the tune. I think we used probably Simpty code to lock it in. And at first they were like, where are your drums? And then it was like, you leave your drums at home. Because at that time, this is you. So we're talking about probably early 80s, right? I mean, that was the sound. And so that transformed everything. So from, from the Lynn drum, which I've got a, a zillion funny stories about that. It's live use. And I triggered it with Crisco cans and transducers and crazy. But, you know, things just really started snowballing. And, you know, I bought keyboards back then. Keyboards had to be, um, a, after a certain point, had to be MIDI. And then got into sequencing and all of that. And it's, it's changed. And I know, um, you know, this is one of the, one of the things we'll probably touch on a little bit later on, but what's happened is because of the technology, I can right here in my studio, I can write music, send it out, have my musician friends play on it, mix, master, and dump it out into the uh, into the wild, right? All right here, where it just wasn't that way before. Um, years ago, there, you know, I worked with artists, and some of these poor artists would uh, demo out songs. First, you know, you had to do a demo. It had to be with live musicians and spend a bunch of money paying people to demo it, then go into the studio, pay even more money. And, you know, the, that whole process. And the songs, a lot of the time, just weren't very good, you know. And and now you can do that sitting at your laptop and put it out there. And you'll probably know right away if it's good or not, you know. Yeah. So, I mean, so basically you kind of see it sometimes on, on TV shows and stuff. You would have to get the entire group together show up at a studio together and record all in one big live performance. And so it wasn't one of these where like you got the background track going and then you could send it over to, to Mark who would record vocals. And then you can't do stuff like that or you, you couldn't then you can now. So I guess the whole, the whole process, the process. Yes. Yes, it has. And I, I had a four track studio as my first studio and my goodness, you know, there was a thing called a noise floor that that people just don't understand anymore. You know, there, there was noise on the analog tape and you had to record things uh, properly, you know, back then and start bouncing things around in a four track. And you better get it right. And if you made a mistake, you know, you it, it's there. You know, I mean, Sergeant Pepper was recorded on, on four track, bouncing tracks around now makes no difference, right? You can just record things over and over. You can find, you can, you can do a hundred takes on something, comp them all together, you know, spend all the time you want in the, in the privacy of your own studio. And it's not that, like you say, it's not that a bunch of people going into a studio and everybody playing together. There was sort of a transitional period, you know, where, Tape went from eight track, 16, 24. Um, and I did sessions for, for a few years at TK Studios, which are the ones that turned out uh, uh, Casey and the Sunshine Band and those, those groups. And we would go in with four, four of us, keyboard, bass, drums, guitar, and we would play someone's demo. And then we would go into the control room and listen, right? And would watch the you know, the meters, right? And if there was one snare drum that was a little off, usually they wouldn't punch in, all right, go on back and do it again. You know, it was that kind of thing. Pressure's on for the drummer. Once I had my part down, pack up, see you later. And everybody else could punch their parts, you know. And that that's the way it went down for, for years. The rhythm section, and then they bring in vocals, and then lead vocal, horn, strings, all of that because of the number of tracks, but uh, 
but now it's just, it, it's so much easier, isn't it? I yeah. Mean, and I, I wonder though, because like it really lowered the barrier to entry for a lot of people who may not have had that money to invest. And, you know, it just, part of me wonders if there's like a cynical side uh, of people who've been in the industry for a while. It's like, well, you know what? We had to do this. It's not fair that it's so easy for all these kids to get out here and do this. Stuff. I, I know that it's a big conversation too in the DJ world. They're like, well, you don't know what it's like to carry around all these crates of vinyl. Um, and I don't, I mean, it's all digital now. So I just, I wonder, it's like, do you ever feel that? Oh man, I have to fight that. You know, I don't want to, there's a great Monty Python skit with four old guys sitting around. Oh, we had it tough. I, I don't want to go down that road because, you know, you just sound like some old dude, you know. It really, really, my message is this. Um, it used to be really tough to do what you're doing now. It's so easy and so much fun and you just got so much freedom and you could do whatever you want, you know. Um, I, I, I have a little bit of resistance from, certain, from some students the ones that are, say, music, en uh, music engineering majors, that, you know, those, those people are, have been into it for, for a long time. But I get a little bit of blowback, like, why do we need to know this? It's like, because you're all like writing songs and, you know, playing music. It's so cool that you can do this and you don't have to go into a studio or rehearse a bunch of people you know, and, and workshop things. You can workshop it right there in your laptop till it's right. Yeah. That certainly does streamline things. I, I, that's a refreshing perspective, just the freedom that, that people have now um, and maybe how much time it took before. But let's talk a little bit about um, digital distribution and how that has changed quite a bit. Um, you know, now we've got all these different platforms where you can, you can buy music, you can listen to music, streaming services, there's all these changing economics of music production and consumption. And uh, how, what, what, what is your take on all that? Do you think that's a net positive for everyone or have we really lost something? Well, first of all, the genie's out of the bottle. So, you know, it is, it is what it is. Personally with my music, it's great because I don't, I'm not, I played a lot of pop music in my life. I'm, I'm writing stuff that I like now. So I'm just getting it out there. I don't care if it sells or not. Hey, if it blows up, great. So what I do is I, I you know, write my music. Um, I use DistroKid for distributor and it's out there. And I couldn't do that years ago. So that's awesome, right? That I can, I can write. Um, and and mix and master and put it out there and it's there and DistroKid places it everywhere. I mean the big three are YouTube, uh, Apple Music, and Spotify. But you know it's out there. It's different though if you're I think a writer, you're let's say a pop writer, and you really want to get some traction, you know, and it's tough, you know. I mean, I have a, a friend right now. He's it's not pop music, but it's kind of a smooth jazz tune that he just released. And he's posting this stuff like just cleared a hundred dollars. You know, I'm in the money. You know, you know, as a joke, but it's it, 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 you know, it's not that funny if if you know if 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 you really want to create a revenue stream. So um, right after lockdown. Uh, I got together with some people to, and, and we actually had a startup to try to create some sort of tech for basically for, for pop songwriters that were kind of unknown. And we brainstormed, we got together every week, we brainstormed. And basically the tech was the, the blockchain world, right? Where basically you put stuff on the blockchain and it can't be changed and it's there forever. And all the metadata sits there. And, you know, ideally, all of your rights stay with that song because it's, you know, the metadata is there. Right. And so we did this and we had all kinds of great ideas. And we had some creative people and we had some some techie people. And then 
one day, uh, I think Quincy Jones got with a startup with 65 million in seed money. It's like, okay, we're out. But it's, it's kind, it's kind of a thing. It's, I mean, you know, I said the genies out of the ball, you, you know, Napster came along and that, that was the end of people uh, paying money for music to, to some degree, you know? Um, and that's when, you know, when the, you know, record sales crashed and all of that. Um, and then streaming services, you know, that was, that was a whole different thing, you know, at least, okay. Some people are making money like the, you know, the Taylor Swift's of the world are making some money, but it's really not good for the aspiring, you know, um, perspiring artist, you know, as you working hard. So, but there are some people, and I actually did, did a little um, research on this. I knew uh, Imogen Heap, who visited the university a few years ago, has been in this for a while. So she's, a, she's an awesome singer and into a lot of different, uh, you know, tech options. And, and she started a company where you basically, basically become her fan and you, I think it's a, a subscription and her stuff is not on streaming services. It's on her own proprietary uh, portal, if you will. Right. And, and I'm looking um, uh, music coin, on chain music, e music, Imante, Tomago, Resonate, Bitsong. Like they're all of these solutions that are really trying to, to create some sort of tech that will enable not the big ones, but the, but the, the people that are they're sort of new to the industry or don't have a big following to create some sort of revenue stream. And I'm hope I'm really hopeful for that, you know? Yeah. I was going to ask you what, what advice you did have for aspiring and possibly perspiring young musicians and how, how to start off now, you know, like, I mean, there were their own challenges. I, there were existing challenges prior to the, all these streaming services and technology. Of course, it wasn't like people could just, you know, get a record deal and that was the end of it. But do you think that uh, something like Imogen, what she's doing, Imogen Heat with, you know, kind of trying to create a subscription service is the way to go? Or are there, is there other advice that you give for new artists trying to break in? Yeah. Well, she's, she already had a name, so she had a following. So it was a little bit easier for her. Right. Um, so she could just, she could reach out to her people and say, this is, this is what I'm doing. Um, for a new artist, it, it's it's different. I think you really have to pound socials, obviously. Um, content, content, con- just get as much content out there as you can, um, and and just just get on it like every day and and you know create your uh, your brand and uh, you know really get that that sort of uh, uh, vibe going, you know, and that buzz going about your brand. And then we need to hope that maybe one of these or several of these technologies will take off so that the artist can get more of the piece of pie. Um, uh, there's, uh, there's a movie called, I think it's Begin Again, um, that came out a few years ago where the artist um, was picked up by this sort of uh, – uh, a producer whose you know life had sort of gone awry, and they they did a record in the, on the streets of New York City, and they um, they did the whole record, they mixed it, and they walked into the recording into the uh, into the record company, and they said, okay, here it is, and and the executives like, yeah, we we like it, um, we're going to get our marketing team behind it, and I think you've got a really good product here. So, the deal is, you know, you get. Um, a dollar on every ten dollars um, for sales, and she and she's like, "Wait, wait a minute! <laughs> I get a dot. I did the whole thing. It's done. I did it. Yeah, um, I get a dollar." And so she's, "I'm not really sure about that." Well, um, end of the story is they they dropped it on their own, but CeeLo Green was in the movie. And CeeLo was a friend of theirs, and CeeLo went, okay, share. And it goes out to millions of people, and that was the end of that. But, but that's the thing. You know, nowadays you can, you can 
create your music, you can put it out there and you can get, um, if you're on what, one of these uh, distribution services uh, that say blockchain oriented or whatever, you can get a bigger piece of the pie, you know, Spotify, not so much, you know. I think it's interesting that you bring up blockchain because we had a whole episode on blockchain, but it was mostly focused on healthcare um, and, and that kind of decentralized technology. So I, I think it's really cool to hear blockchain come back up again when we're talking about music and digital distribution. So I'm wondering, do you see anything that could really shake up those streaming services? You know, the Spotify, Apple, YouTube, you know, anything coming down the pike that, you know, like when Spotify came out or when these streaming services happened, like that was a big shakeup to the whole industry. Is there anything that you see coming that could shake it up again? Well, maybe that's it, you know, and you guys probably remember a couple of years ago when the NFT craze hit and it's still kind of around a little bit. It was like, oh, my God, you know, the, these artists and then musicians are making millions of dollars. Oh, my God, what's happening here with this NFT thing? Well, um, and I was into it, you know, I was following all that, you know, and I, you know, took a little money and put it into crypto and, and all that. Well, you know, as you know, you know, crypto tanked and, you know, maybe it'll be back, maybe not. I think it's a cool idea. You know, the NFT thing, it blew up and then it sort of imploded. Now they're still around and there are people still doing it. So I think people are wary of, oh, oh, no, 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 that crypto, that, nah, we, we, we don't want to get involved in that. Blockchain is, is a viable technology. You know, that's not something that's like a, you know, a fad or whatever. It's not, you know, I believe, you know, it's, it's something that's, that's going to be around. And, uh, you know, you did the, the healthcare podcast. There, there are other, um, uh, there's decentralized finance and there's, um, I, uh, uh, it escapes me now, but there are companies that need to have their data preserved in that way. And I think blockchain is, might be the way to go, you know, or maybe something that we don't even know about now. Right. Yeah. Uh, I mean, the, the, you're exactly right. It's just something that we can never imagine could happen, could come in and yes. just really right. change and, I mean, my goodness, I had a I had a studio in my house with an eight track, an eight track recording studio, great big console. And it was I constantly had to throw money into it to keep it going. It was a fraction of what's on my phone. right now. I would never have dreamed that I could do what I do on the phone, you know. And so we don't know. Maybe there's something, you know, coming coming down the road that we don't even know about. But. You know, and another thing with like technology and how it's it's changing music uh, is live performances. And, and one thing that really comes to mind is, and I, I don't know exactly what it's called, but they would do these these projections of you, you know deceased singers. And I, I saw one of James Brown and one of Elvis, and it's like they are having these performances done by singers who have been dead for a long time. And it's just like, I, I know like if you look behind the scenes with, with like rights and royalties and stuff, I'm sure that's complicated, but it, it just, it makes me wonder like, what is your thoughts on live performance technology? Cause it, I, I'm a guy like I'm a millennial, but I still enjoy, you know, full band traditional concert, you know, like blast my ears off uh, versus all these festival DJs that go up there and they just play this music that's all digital, but uh, I don't know. What, what are your thoughts on, on live performances and what that's done? Well, it's, the, it's really this sort of uh, co conflict that I have all the time. I mean, you know, I really, really like, you know, to, to hike in the woods and be in the outdoors, and I, but I really like tech at the same time. And, it, and it's like two different things. I love playing live and I love the feeling that I get, you know, from the audience, right? Because it's all like sort of one sort of ether, you know, and you feed off of that. There's nothing like, like you say, like seeing a live band, getting your, 
you know, your face <laughs> crushed. Just it, yeah, just <laughs> on the other hand, I've seen some really cool concerts with a lot of um, like multimedia presentations. I the hologram thing is is super creepy, but it's pretty cool, right? I keep waiting for him to bring uh, Jerry Garcia back with, you know, the Ungrateful Dead yeah. <laughs> <laughs> as a as a hologram. But but I, I think I think it's it's amazing, you know, that uh, what is it, the the Sphere in Las Vegas? Oh yeah, you know, I've I've got to see that mm-hmm. because that just looks like you know maybe the wave of the future. Um, so I'm torn, you know. Love live performance, love people all playing together at one time, but but the tech end of it is 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 pretty interesting, you know. Yeah, I mean, they're the fact that they're holding full concerts in in video games like Fortnite. You know, they they've done full concerts and special events there. Uh, I've seen people use VR technology for various things. Uh, whether it's a, a virtual nightclub or like you're sitting uh, basically in the front row at a concert, but it's all virtual. And, and it just it amazes me the amount of reach, which I think the reach is great because you get to reach a whole new generation of people. But it, it does kind of make me curious about these traditional live performances, if those are going to go by the wayside to where it, and that's going to really shift a lot. But, you know, I still like I said, I appreciate, uh, now I have a good friend who just went to a, a grateful dead concert and, you know, granted not the missing a couple. Um, but I just, I, I think that's really another thing like the digital distribution, like what's going to happen in five years. And in fact, Steve, if you want to give me a prediction five years from today, what a live performance could look like, and then we can reference it and say, Steve Rucker knew five years ago, this Whoa, was going to happen. Man, what would you say? Spot. On the spot. Well, I, I had this idea years ago. Um, I'm a football fan, and and um, where you have cameras all over the field, and you sit home. You don't have to go to the stadium. You could sit home, like with a joystick. And okay, I want to see it from here, from here, from here. And you could be like under center and whatever, right? Okay. So, you know, I could see again. I love live concerts with a bunch of humans up on stage playing, but I could see where. That would be a pretty cool way to see a group, right? To be able to just sit home. I've got my mixing headphones on. I've got my, you know, VR glasses on or a massive, you know, screen in front of me. And I can see this concert or hear it from any vantage, any vantage point I want, right? So that, and, and you know, a little bit of that started happening. Like the pandemic kicked a bunch of doors open, Right. I mean, at the at the university, we we, we didn't even think about uh, remote recording or, you know, there there was doll work, but it was mostly with engineering students. And now freshman year, I teach a course. All the freshmen have to do production in their DAWs. And the only reason this happened or the only reason it got it got jump started is because singers couldn't sing. So let's record the rhythm section. And then the singers will take the recording and sing it in their dorm room or something, right? Because they couldn't sing because of, you know, the the spreading germs. And now now it's a thing. Well, another thing that happened around the same time is you had all of these uh, concerts, like virtual concerts. And some of them, you actually pay money to see a concert, but it's somebody in a studio somewhere, you know, where the sound was was really happening and you couldn't see any live concerts, but you could sit here in your, you know, in your bedroom or whatever and, and watch a concert, you know? Yeah. I, I think, I think that would be fun. And, and I just don't want to pay more uh, to be in the front row, you know, necessarily, but, <laughs> right. yeah. <laughs> but yeah. who knows? It, Everybody's in the front row, but you, but you know what, but look at what happened. I think a lot of people were afraid, oh, there's not going to be any live shows anymore, but you know, come on. I mean, it, it, when things started to ease up, people were craving a lot of music and they really they really flocked to the concerts. I, I have two former students in town right now. One is uh, on a tour with Morrissey and the other's in a big tour with Enrique Iglesias and, and Pitbull. And, and they're, I mean, they're touring. 
it's like, you know, just, just the way things used to be. Right. So, and people are filling up the venues and people really want to see that, you know? So, so maybe it'll be both, you know, maybe that's great. I love what you were saying. Uh, well, just at the beginning about some of the way that streaming services and technology has kind of not even just streaming services, but so many different parts of technology and music gives um, musicians more freedom to get their music out there. And what you were describing with concerts, you know, the the virtual reality options. I love the sound of that because it's it gives not only the musicians but also the fans another avenue, like another outlet to enjoy the music. Um, and it's, that's kind of a, a neat byproduct of, of the way that technology and music has come together. So maybe you can help us. We were talking about this last week, but, um, so we work at a software development company, obviously, and with a lot of developers and very anecdotally, we don't have stats on this, but many to most seem to also be musicians. And I wonder, I wonder why that, and you know, people I know in my life, that's also the case. And perhaps it's, how you came into it, you know, early on where you had a job you could do for some of the time, but you needed a job you needed to do for another part of the time. And they could potentially be, you know, software development or just, you know, technology development in general and music could kind of be, um, uh, simpatico for that reason. But do you have any other insights into how, you know, your brain works and why coding and development kind of struck a nerve, maybe not in the same way that music does, but, um, you know, what are your thoughts on that? So I have strong feelings about the idea that music is math, right? And I have and I have people that ask me that all the time. I don't see it that way, all right? So I, I'll, I'll get back to this. Music is sound. It starts here, it goes here. It's, if you want to think about it this way, when you go to a concert, it's one continuous stream of sound from, from beginning to end, right? But when we write it out, when we codify it, we chop it up into bits. True, if it's, you know, if it's in 4-4, the bars are lined up in 4-4, and, and, and it's the way musicians kind of perceive the groove or whatever. But for me, and, the, and it's just a subjective thing, I don't see the connection there so much. I... I I see music as one thing and coding as another thing. However, for whatever reason, there are a lot of musicians in that sphere. And there's something called math rock, right? Which is kind of prog rock that's that's very kind of oriented toward numbers and odd meters and and that kind of thing. Um, and And I can see that. And some musicians really go down that road, you know, and think of things more in terms of math than music. Personally, though, again, subjectively, um, I don't really see it that way. I I see um, the numbers are a way that we can chop the music up, you know, digitize it and save it for eternity, you know, just just so people can can read it. Um, And I I think that uh, what happens is when you when you think about it too much in terms of math and numbers, then you, you take away from the kind of the soul of the, of the music. So anyway, that's my, that's my response, but totally agree. I I was in a, I was in a shop, uh, coding shop where there were so many musicians. We had one room in the office building with instruments in it and we just go in and play, you know, on our off time. Yeah. Yeah. Similarly, Atiba had a band for a while and it had about 25 people in it. It was maybe, I'm not sure the breakdown of who, what, who was playing what, but yeah, there was all kinds of folks. But to your math analogy, I was thinking maybe, may, I mean, I am not a musician, so this is just was my initial thought, but it does seem like there's so much baked, so much math baked into music, maybe that you're not fully aware of, but that just is innately in there. And perhaps the coding mindset is complementary to a musical mindset just in in an innate way because of the math piece that's baked into it even if you're not totally aware of it yeah oh there are numbers in there for sure and 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 you know um when you're playing in a certain meter if it's four four or three four um 
you should feel it, but initially you may be counting it. Now, I do have to tell you that my, when I first started coding, so when you sit down and, and play music, when I play drums, I'm totally focused or should be on the task at hand. And if I'm playing years ago, there used to be this five hour gig. I'm in every minute of it, right? So when I got my first programming job, the brain was still working like that. And I'd be sitting there working on a problem for like 10 hours. It's like, Steve, you better get up, you know, or you're, you're going to go insane. Um, because I had that same kind of mindset that you have when you're playing music. And, you know, it, you know, it, as, a, as a coder, you just get possessed sometimes by a problem and you just want to keep working it, working it, working it until you find a solution. Of course, so now I've got my best buddy, um, ChatGPT, um, uh, he's just an insane programmer. I mean, my goodness, you know, I just, and the cool thing about, uh, stop me if I'm going off on a tangent, but the cool thing about chat GPT is you can carry on the conversation all day long. Yeah. Okay. Thanks for that. That's cool. But what if I change the variable to this? Okay. Oh yes. Okay. Yeah. You know, I got an error. Oh, I'm so sorry. Um, try this. Yeah, you know what? That didn't work. Do you have another method? Um, yeah, um, and it's always apologizing, right? Um, yeah, I'm sorry. I wasn't abundantly clear about that. Well, why don't you try this? And this can go on all day. You know, I used to use Stack Overflow. And it's like you go, okay, there's some, there's, nah, that didn't work. Let me go to the next example. Nah, none of these are working. Well, okay, I'll go somewhere else. ChatGPT is sitting there right with you. I feel like sometimes it's such a help that. I want to give it a Christmas bonus or something, you know? I mean, because it's just like, it's working for free. If you don't mind me asking, is it music related? Is it life related? Is it tech related or just all of the above? Whatever you're kind of thinking about. Totally tech related. So, um, you know, I've, I've got this, you know, I've got this glob of HTML and it's, and it's, um, you know, I've got these variables in there and I need to quickly turn it into an accordion. Boom, done. Those kind of things where, yeah, I've done it over and over and over again. I've done that, but I'll still have to go in and like mess around. And it's just like, boom, here's your JavaScript. Here's your CSS. Here's your HTML. Boom, throw it in there and you're done. It's really, really cool. Also for, uh, for writing, you know, it's, it's really good. And, and it, to a point. Right. It's very proper and it comes up maybe with some words you didn't think of. So I'll write something um, and then I'll I'll say improve colon, you know, paste and it'll go through and, and I'll. OK. Oh, this is cool. It's like kind of inspires me maybe to to do it in a different way. But um, I think some people are really nervous about um uh, the musical implications, right? And so, uh, for example, I'm writing, my son's singer-songwriter, Brian Rucker, and we're driving through the mountains, and he said, hey, check this out. And my my engineer uh, has Kanye singing one of my songs, so, you know, he rolls it, and there's Kanye, you know, singing Brian's song, right? Not really, but... That's a little scary. And so s singers, I think, are, are experienced what drummers had to go through years and years ago with drum machines. It's like, wow, some of those, some of those AI vocals are pretty, pretty cool. It, it's scary. Cool. Like, I, I remember when they came out with one, one of the first ones was a Drake one, which, you know, he has a very unique sound and style. And so... Yeah, that that was kind of like eye opening. It's like holy, holy cow! Like these people can write th this AI can write an entire song, and, and like, what are the implications of that? Yeah, it, that's where it gets a little weird. So I did a little research, right? And because I figured we'd talk about this, and I went to something called I went to a, a song generator, right? Song lyrics generator. I, I won't give you the name, but anyway, I think I. Yeah, they want like a prompt. So I, I, I just typed in something really general like love, you know, and boom, a couple of seconds later, spits out this song, sweet nothing. And here's how it goes. From the moment you walked into my life, I felt my heart skip a beat. 
I knew right there and then that you were the one for me. Chorus, because I ain't never known love like this. Oh, it's such a sweet. Are you kidding me? I mean, our sing, our our lyric writing teacher would just like, sorry, go back, you know, go back to the drawing board. It's really awful. Um, so I think, you know, maybe it'll improve a little bit, but I, you know, the, the optimistic me says, yeah, I, th- I think you need to have some a little more human experience in there. And, and where does this stuff come from anyway? Right. I mean, where does, you know, when you go to chat GPT or whatever, it's a lot of data that that's fed in, you know, and you use machine learning to, to put it together. So these are lyrics that were out there at some point, right? The first thing I did with chat GPT when it first came out is I, I said, create a 14 week drum set course, right? Bam. There it was seconds later because I teach a 14 week drum set course. And it's like, Oh my goodness. It's like, this is my drum set course. So I reached out to one of the deans and he said, yeah, it probably is. You know, like some com- components of your drum set course, you know? So my son, my son, Matthew, who's also a coder, but a very, very kind of idealistic, you know, he's sort of a child of the sixties, you know, kind of, he's like, how do these people get paid that, created all of this right he's kind of right you know it's like that data that's in there was created by someone but anyway we were getting off topic there but that's my uh that's my take on lyric writing i'm glad you said that though because that that's actually that was the topic i wanted to like wrap everything up with anyway was just like what what are your thoughts on that and and i think you just summarized it really well And, and it's just it's one of those things that's so fresh still and it's a little scary. I can see like you, you were talking and even, you know, writing show notes for for a podcast recording like chat GPT is a great help for stuff like that. And then you can kind of tweak it based on who you're working with. But but when you start creating something of substance, like an actual vocal of some that sounds just like an artist, like that's when things start to get a little scary. <laughs> so um uh, and we could probably do an entire another show at some point in the future just on uh, the implications of AI in, in this industry. But uh, but honestly, Steve, I, I think this whole conversation was amazing. It was really good to hear your take on you know where music was, where it is now, where it might be in five years. And again, we can reference this podcast to give you all the credit. But uh, but seriously, we just like I want to personally say thank you. I know Anna Kate, thank you like for for being here, but Uh, It really was a great episode, and we're glad you joined us today. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Half Geek, Half Human podcast. Make sure to follow the Half Geek, Half Human podcast on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn. We'll see you next time. You've been listening to Half Geek, Half Human. 